uh, linear, linear motion. So let's say we have a little system, coupler, that's, that's coupler C, and let's say we have some sort of stage, because you need some sort of bearing for this, some sort of bearing block for this, this could be a linear bearing, it could be a rotary bearing, it could be wheels, um, generally just not sliding around. And at some point, if you have mass up here that you wanna move, you need to, and I'll just change this a little bit, you need to put in some sort of This is, um, this whiteboard, it's, my drawings look a lot better in, on a real whiteboard. <laughs> I think it's because there's more friction. I think they, they got the friction wrong in this thing. They should have added more friction somehow. Maybe there's a thing I can buy that adds friction, but it's really hard to draw a lead screw with an Apple pencil. Anyway, so, and then one other thing you have in here is you tend to have um, the nut. So now this is a little bit weird and, and this could be vertical or horizontal and, and different things. One of the things I will point out is that when you read through the seven or the, the motor sizing handbook that you can download as a PDF, there's lots of kind of example formulas in there. It's not very likely that you can grab any of those formulas and just plunk them into your system. Um, most of the time you have something else going on and you've got to kind of customize what you're doing. Um, so motor sizing programs, you could put this in real easy. This, would, the, the, you know, this is an easy, easy thing to size. The only tricky part of this is what happens to the, this is mass and it's moving linearly. Where's the inertia? You always think inertia is when you rotate something, right? So how do you deal with this mass? Back here, the motor is turning. That's obvious. That's an inertia. But how do you deal with this? How does it look to the motor as an inertia of the load? So what we're going to do is the same kind of thing. When We're going to start out with TA. And so we'll say TA um, of this system will go as far away from the motor as you can. And... It's going to be inertia of the mass divided by, and we're going to do the same thing exactly. This part of it's identical. We're going to start doing the Ninja Warrior thing. So we're going to take the mass, and the thing we have to do is we have to jump onto the nut. Are they welded together? Could you bolt them together? They probably are. So there's probably nothing to do there. So there's no inefficiency going onto the nut. But as soon as you go from the nut to the screw, now you have you know, the screw turning and you gotta jump onto it. It's not the same as what you're doing. That's your signal. There's an inefficiency there. So you're going to have the inefficiency of the screw when you um, try to drive this mass from this motor. And that's fine. It has an inefficiency to it. And if it's a ball screw, the inefficiency is going to be 0.85. You go look it up. 0 0.9, 0 0.85. If it's a friction style lead screw where you have sliding instead of rolling, it's the same thing between a bushing and a bearing. A bushing is sliding friction and a bearing is rolling friction. Same thing with ball screw and lead screw. Lead screw tends to mean sliding friction like a bolt and a nut would be a type of v-thread lead screw but a ball screw has lots of rolling elements inside there that raise the efficiency and will also allow you to have 100 percent duty cycle it's not heating up so you can run it harder all right so we run along we're running along da, 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 and we jump onto the coupler and the motor that's all so the rest of this term as we're writing this along, plus inertia of the uh, nut. And the inertia of the nut 
is you have to jump off the nut onto the screw. There's the inefficiency. Plus inertia of the screw. Okay, if you're, the, if you're on the screw already, it's being directly driven by the motor. There isn't a denominator. All right, that's good. Um, plus inertia of the coupler, plus inertia of the motor times alpha. Units are gonna be important here, really important because you're likely to have calculated alpha in linear units. And so you've got to convert at some point. Um, a lot of times you have to add the pitch of the screw into, and, and this has to be rotary units, but as long as you're carrying your units, you'll pick it up and you'll, you'll find, oops, I forgot the linear to rotary conversion, okay? So pitch is in terms of usually rev per, you know, length, rev per centimeter, revs per inch are the, would, would be the two common. And lead, if you hear that term, is generally, there's a little exception that you'll never run across, but it's essentially inverse of pitch. So the lead is how far does it turn each rotation, okay? It's easier to use pitch than it is lead in most of these formulas. Um, so that's what you'll see most, most common. So that's the easy acceleration torque. Now, what is JM exactly? How do you actually calculate? Notice I put the inertia of the mass. What's well, a mass? How does it have inertia? Well, we're turning it. And in this case, it's really, if we knew, before we point, took a mass and we said, if it was a point mass, it was MR squared. And we didn't do any sort of integration. It just, it was pretty easy to do as a point mass. It's kind of the same thing for us. That looks like a point mass and it's mass, what happened here? Oops, there we go. Um, it's mass, in this case now, the R squared is this thing, I kind of call it an effective lead, but it's two pi times the pitch squared. And when you go do a little unit analysis on this, it's, it's kind of like M over R squared. If you use lead instead of pitch, this actually goes into the numerator and you start to see an M R squared with the two pi in there. Um, so, that's, that is the number then that would go, that would go into that. All right, so now we need, let's see, then we need J of the nut. Uh, that's gonna be the same. That's gonna be the same as J of the mass because you could have welded them together. Okay, so then J of the screw How do you figure that out? Well, you could look it up, but the easiest thing is to estimate it as, um, estimate as a solid cylinder. Now, the thing I get asked a lot is, well, wait a minute, this, this lead screw has an outer um, diameter and then it has a pitch diameter, which is kind of the, the inner diameter. Which one do I use for the diameter? It doesn't matter. Use the outer one. It's a worst case, you're, you're applying it to something safety factor at the end, plus you're probably not even gonna pick this lead screw. It might turn out to be something different. So first pass, it doesn't really matter. Essentially at some point, once you pick a screw, then the manufacturer will tell you exactly what the inertia of that screw is. But for now, um, just estimate it as a solid cylinder, coupler, motor, and you are now have um, a number that is what goes into that. The coupler, um, look it up. They always list it, okay? So linear motion, that's the, the most common is lead screws um, that you'll see. Um, what else is the other? I'm not gonna cover cam 
The other type of motion that you're going to get into is something like this. I'm going to try and draw this a little bit um, 3D, I suppose. So let's say that you had a conveyor. Okay, so we have a conveyor and this conveyor has, um, and then we're going to attach down here, we're going to put um, a motor on our, so, so we have a motor attached to a conveyor and then somewhere sitting on this, let's see, I think I need to draw another line right there. That makes it look a little bit better. There we go. So somewhere sitting on this, we have some sort of mass that you're moving back and forth. This would be what you would call some sort, of, it'd be a, basically a belt and pulley system. And so there's a whole separate category in the motor sizing handbook for belts and pulley systems. Um, the, sometimes the pulleys are large, sometimes they're small, but the, the main thing is that you have linear motion here and rotary motion here. Sometimes the solution to this, the, the high-tech solution is if you have linear motion by a linear motor. Um, except for when you start to actually apply that and you see the cost of it, then you typically quickly backpedal and do a standard rotary motor and some translation mechanisms. And that's what you have here is a mass that goes back and forth. The only tricky part about this is how does this mass get treated by the motor? And here's the way I drew it, it's hard to figure out. But imagine what, I, what would happen if I drew this and I made it over here and I drew it here. I drew the mass in that position because it's gonna go back and forth, right? So if I draw the mass over here, now if I drew this on end, you have a motor. And if you looked at it straight down the line, it would kind of look like this. You would see a motor and you'd see a mass. And so the inertia of the mass, the, 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 what actually gets plugged into the formula in the acceleration formula is really just the mass times the radius squared. But in this, this case, it's the radius of, I'm gonna say the driving pulley or the driving gear. So in this case, what that radius would be, that radius would be this radius right here. That would be R. So it's the radius of that driving pulley. Or if you were looking at it down here, it would be that, R, right? So it's MR squared. And so really, even though it's down over here to the motor, it doesn't ever know that it's here or here. It has no idea. So let's analyze it over here. It doesn't change as it moves along. It doesn't suddenly gain more inertia. And as soon as you look at it over here, you go, oh, it's a point mass at a radius. Easy, MR squared, right? So, you know, boom, it's MR squared. It's easy to figure out. And then what's the inertia of the belt? Well, it's the same. What's the, the inertia of the belt? Is the mass of the belt times the radius of the driving pulley squared, not the diameter, the radius. Um, and then the inertia of the driving pulley is simply a, probably a hollow cylinder. And it's directly driven to the motor. So therefore now you're back to normal inertia. You have a rotating load that's connected to the inertia, make it a hollow cylinder and calculate it as such. So um, those are the only really things that happen with the, when you'd have the linear translation is you have to deal with those. There's one other thing that happens though on the lead screw. 
um, let me go back to that for a minute. And I, I forgot about this. Let me go back to this. Um, what happens when you have forces out here? So let's say that you have to push, let's say we need a force right here. We need a force that we have to do some work, okay? What do you do with that force? How does that translate back um, to a torque at the motor, right? How do we get the force out there? Inertia I just showed you, but when you deal with the torque due to friction, let's just, let's just write that formula real quick. The torque due to friction for a lead screw is torque preload, torque preload, and this is back to, well, we probably had to have some bearings. Probably if you're dealing with something that moves back and forth, you better have a bearing that can handle those linear forces. That is called a thrust bearing. And the way you get rid of slop moving back and forth is you preload them against each other. Otherwise, the lead screw is going to move back and forth when you move it. So you have preload. You have preload right there. Um, you have preload right there. That's preload. That's an, a translation. And there could be slop in there. And there could be preload as you tighten it to get rid of that slop. The point is down over here, there's a non-zero value just to break the friction. And a lead screw or a ball screw manufacturer will give you that number. And it's usually like 18 ounce inches um, if you're using the English system. If you're using metric, I don't know, you know some 0.02 Newton meters or something. Um, so we have the preload plus what do you do with that force? Well, that for, it's a force, and you're going to use essentially the formula that they, I call it the bolt formula. Um, when you go to torque a bolt, uh, you're really putting a bolt into a certain amount of tension, and you're going to put an intention up both below the ultimate strength, or actually below the yield strength, maybe 80% of the yield strength, you're going to stretch the bolt. Um, and at 80%, that's the amount of torque that you need to get the, the thing to be used properly. In order to convert from that force that it takes to stretch a bolt to the torque that you would set on your torque wrench, you use 2 pi times the pitch times the efficiency. Let me rewrite efficiency times the efficiency. So this, um, this right here, this formula where you're taking a force, which would be in Newtons, and you're dividing by two pi, there's radians per rev. Pitch is the linear revs per inch. There's, now you got your inches gone. Um, and the efficiency. If you've ever done a torque uh, operation on a bolt, you'll know that they offer two different torques, one for lubricated and one for non-lubricated. They might also offer a different torque for coarse thread versus fine thread. Lubricated, non-lubricated changes the efficiency. Fine thread versus coarse thread is a different pitch of the screw. The exact same thing for converting force to torque in a bolt is the same formula we use to convert forces that are out here um, to torques at the motor. And that's the conversion formula. And so you can use it if you had torque and you want force, you, you convert back and forth. So that is our, I call it the bolt formula. Yeah. We need to talk about pulleys and, and um, using pulleys and gears a little bit more. Uh, so, when we're dealing with belts and pulleys, we know, let's, let's deal with a little a system here. Let's deal with, here's a motor. And let's say we need a gear ratio. So we want a gear ratio. What gears are hard 
to, to put together. We talked about that to mesh them and get the tolerances right. But if you use a couple pulleys and then you use some sort of belt, what I just drew is a gear reduction. So because this this device out here, this the secondary pulley has a different rotational velocity. And the great thing about doing belts like this is that you, you generally need some sort of tensioner. That's a, a spring tensioner of some sort. You need some sort of tension in the belt so that it's not flopping around. And just tension, you, one of the things that when you're designing a belt system, you're going to need to probably look at the force here, which is related to the torque through the radius. And your tension, that you tension your belt, better be higher than the force that you want to transmit, or you're going to be, um, you're going to have, you know, droop in your belt. So you got to have tension higher than the force. So tension has to be greater than the force. Tension in the belt greater than the force that you want to, uh, what do we call that? I'll just call it F for now. Um, so the tolerance is really easy on this. You didn't really care where the center of this was so much compared to the center of that because we just tension it with a little bit of a tensioner. It takes all the hard part off. But back to that example that we used um, just even a, let's see, we had the inertia out here. Let, Let's say we have an inertia of, remember the inertia of a mass that's moving here is MR squared. There is no reduction. Out here we get the, the reduction, but what I drew here was, let's see if I can kind of draw this in. Let's, let's say here's this radius and here is that radius. Maybe, maybe I drew about a three to one ratio. I hope that what you can already see is when I go to calculate, you should have looked at this. Let's call this pulley two and call this pulley one. The inertia of pulley two, well, let's see. The inertia goes up by, let's see, I think it was pi times L, and L is not, you know, it's, it's not very, doesn't have to be very wide. So L is low. We'll make it out of aluminum. So we'll keep, or we might even make it a hollow cylinder, right? And then have some spokes or something on it. But over here, R to the fourth, is a problem and this is R. That's an over two. So you have a huge inertia that you just put in your system because it was easy to get a two to one ratio out of a belt and pulley system or three to one. But what happens if let's say our, our um, in that system that we had before you had you had, uh, let's see, you had the 100 to 1, right? Here's the motor, the little motor, and we had a 100 to 1 ratio. This reduced it by n squared or 9. So now you're down to 100, from 100 to 1, you're down to about, you're down to, down to about 12 to 1. That's still no good. So let's try a 4 to 1 ratio. Well, all right, four to one ratio means one, two, and I'm comparing it to this over here, right? There's four to one, it's gotta be, I'm comparing it to that. So one, two, three, four. So now our, our pulley got that big. You see the problem. We're not going anywhere fast with this. This this is terrible. You got safety issues. You got inertia issues. What are you, how are you going to guard this? You know, put big guards. This is yucky. Um, we don't do this. Okay. What you do 
is you, if you have something out here that needs to turn, you can do a belt and pulley, but you add in the proper solution is add in gearing as a gear, gear head. We talked about that and all of a sudden the gears are small um, and you've solved the same problem and you've got control of the load and you bought your way into a solution instead of having a, a weird thing. The one other thing that, that's really bad about this is I want you to look at this belt right here. That belt, that belt is when you just the fact that you're saying talking about tensioning a belt means the belt has a torsional, not torsional, I guess it's, it just belt has stretch. Um, actually, it has a spring constant. <laughs> it might be a better way to put it. You know that if you put a certain force into that belt, it's going to elongate by a certain amount. So that right there, that is a bad word. <laughs> if you just introduced a bad spring in between your load and your motor. And now that, now they make timing belts that are very stiff and are, have Kevlar or even steel reinforced belts. But still, you've introduced a big section of spring in between your load and your motor. It's not gonna operate, you're gonna have control issues. You can tell your motor what to do, but your load's not gonna play the same game, okay? So don't do belts and pulleys, or don't, don't do a, um, don't design your own belt system. It's fine, you, the place you see these is in motor control. You see them on conveyors and augers where you need to adjust the, you know, the, the AC motor that you plug into the wall goes 1750 RPM. We need the load to go, you know, four times slower than that. So we'll put in a four to one belt system, but nowhere in there did we care about control. We just, we weren't paying attention to the exact velocity or the exact positioning of the load. Just spin it, accelerate it, spin it. And, and make it turn. We weren't concerned about the control aspect of it in motor control. And that's where you see lots of belt and pulleys get used is on AC motors that you have to change the speed and, and uh, you wanna do it mechanically. I deal with the bandwidth of the system in my mind a lot where you're thinking about um, something that can, um, this is frequency, oops, frequency and amplitude, right, are two things for, for bandwidth. So at some point, if you remember, at some point they say, oh, well, where the, where the amplitude decreases to 0 0.707, then you come down here, and this is now called your bandwidth. And essentially that's the portion where it gets Amplitude, think of, think if I get rid of the word amplitude and I'm going to call this accuracy. Oops, come on. Because it was supposed to get to, it was supposed to get to here, but it only got to here before it was time to turn around or, you know, we didn't get there. Um, and on this axis, I'm going to not, I won't, I'm going to get rid of that term and I'm going to call this uh, throughput. So as we want this machine to go faster and faster, um, you're going to ask for the motion to go, you know, and you, you guys see this when you, even if I try and move my hand back and forth, I wait it here. That's, this is the perfect amplitude right here. Boom, boom, amplitude of one. But as I try and go faster and faster, Right, pretty soon, I don't make the amplitude. Okay, my bandwidth was, was defined as where I get to 0 0.707 of the, the amplitude that was after, and that happens, um, I lose it. And this is what mechanical things do, is they have a mechanical bandwidth to them, and so you're actually after more control is what you want, 
And the way you get more control is with stiffer mechanisms. Once you have enough torque, think about increasing the stiffness, not the mass. One of the things that if you really have the, a problem with the, the shaft of a motor um, being not stiff enough, and it's usually not necessarily that, it's usually that. It's that first coupler, that's a spring. You're trying to, you know, you, you, know, you put the coupler in to, to get rid of the, the misalignment that's natural to mounting things together um, without stressing out the bearings. So you put this in there and that's a, it's a torsional spring. That's the real problem right there. So what, what more and more they do is they use what's called a direct drive motor. This is in the higher bandwidth robotics where again, higher accuracy or higher throughput, whichever one at the higher bandwidth robotics, they got rid of all this stuff. They got rid of the gearing that's on here, they get rid of it all. And they use a motor um, let's see, let me draw that. They went from hot dog style to a motor that is, oops, dang it. Come on, get the right color. And now you can mount your mass right to it. The, the direct drive motors actually have mounting surfaces. They don't have a spindly little shaft you mount your mass right to it. The downside of a direct motor is instead of having bearings that are this big right here, now your bearing was this big. And that's where it starts to get expensive. Mounting the bearing, machining the bearing, buying the bearing, you know, applying it, that's where it got expensive. But if you can do this, then you've increased your stiffness because right here, there wasn't any, any um, spring. There's no way to get rid of the spring that is in here, the spring that's in here, and you know, going along that path. So this is gonna be a higher bandwidth system, but the motor's way more expensive. So it's, it's, a, it's a way to solve the problem and it's one of those supply things where as you get more people trying to solve it with the direct drive motor, volumes go up, prices go down. Um, it's, it's more of a thing now than it was say 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was like, ooh, it, you better really need to justify the use of that motor control wise. And now it's like, oh, direct drive motors come in lots of different packages. Cole Morgan makes really good ones. Parker makes really good ones. Um, Scala makes good ones. Uh, does Scala make? Anyway, there's, there's, there's manufacturers that make these now that, well, 